I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, as they were putting Bob in the ambulance, he, in this sweet way, said, I'm really sorry, I'm going to miss your sermon. Bless his heart, he always has a question after my sermon, so I know that he is paying attention, but I promised him that I would try to do a good job for you all today. When I was a little girl, I was terribly afraid of the dark. Night after night, one of my parents, or perhaps one of my older siblings, would read me a story and tuck me into bed, and despite my protests, turn out the light. In the dark, shadows loom large. The chair in my room would turn into a monster. The light that is peeking in from the porch window was his fiery breath. And the pair of pants that were resting on the floor, the ones that I was supposed to have put in the dirty clothes hamper, would turn into an alligator. I remember being frozen in fear. I couldn't escape. I was sure that if my feet hit the floor, that the boogeyman was going to grab my feet and I would be swept up. I would cry softly so as to not disturb the monsters, and someone in my family would lovingly hear me and open the door. And as they opened the door, my room would be illuminated by the hall lights, and I would see that the monster was really just a chair, the alligator was just a pair of pants, and the only thing under my bed were a few stray toys and dust bunnies. Now you have heard me talk a lot about vulnerability and how embracing our, in embracing our vulnerability we embrace joy, we embrace God. And you might think that I've said all that I need to say about vulnerability, but I'm going to talk about it again. But this time... I'm going to talk about the dark side of, of vulnerability. The easily exploited, the dismissed, and disposable people among us. That is why we are afraid to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, I think, because we don't want to be dismissed or disposed of. We all need to matter The gospel lesson today, I have to say, is hard to read, and it can be hard to hear. It strikes at the heart of what makes us tender and afraid. This teaching has a history of interpretation that has already, that has been painful in, a, in situations which are already painful and hurtful. Over the years, this passage about marriage and divorce has been used by people, and it's been used by the church, to cast a dark pall to condemn and shame the divorced. It has been used to hold people in loveless marriages, unhappy, even abusive marriages. And it has been used as a tool to justify the exclusion and expulsion of some of our brothers and sisters from our sacraments and from our worship communities. This is certainly not the only passage that has, in the history of interpretation, been used in ways that are hurtful. And I think that this lesson is particularly hurtful because divorce has touched all of us. Because we all know that divorce hurts. Even in the most amicable settlements, divorce involves pain. And whether your experience is your own, or your parents, or your child's, or our brother, or our sister, a friend, or a member of this worship community, we are all touched by the ripping apart of what was once good 
and whole. Our faith tradition believes that Holy Scriptures hold all things necessary for salvation. And we use tradition and we use reason to help us shed light and discern the will of a living God. My hope is to crack that door a little bit and let some light into this room. If we can do this, perhaps we can hear and read this gospel lesson differently in a way that is more in line with the love and compassion that we know Jesus Christ has for us. Perhaps we can not only ease some of the pain, but maybe we can look to see how this teaching might be used to the glory of God and God's creation. Perhaps we can make this scripture live fully in our lives, not as something to be ashamed of or afraid of, but as something that enriches and inspires a life in Christ. I think the first thing that we need to do is to see how the institution of marriage has changed in the last 2,000 years. Each of our marriages are different, just as each of us are different, but today marriage is intended to be a covenant between two people that are united in a shared life. There is love and there is trust. This is in contrast to ancient times when monogamy was a new norm. Marriage was an agreement between two families. Love had nothing to do with them coming together. Marriage was designed to strengthen and to protect the societal unit, and it was an alliance of sorts. Women were completely dependent on the men in their lives, on their husbands. They were property. In marriage, a female, often a girl in our eyes, goes from her father's house to her betrothed family home. Her role is to serve that family and to bear children that will in turn support the family structure. It is a dangerous business being a woman. It is a matter of harsh survival in a world where women had no rights. And a woman who was cast aside in divorce was most likely sentenced to a life of destitution and prostitution. So when Jesus speaks out against divorce, it's not about moral judgment it is about social justice. That is why Jesus, this, this passage is about divorce is immediately followed by a passage about children. Jesus is speaking out here against the exploitation and disposal of the most vulnerable among us. By claiming by speaking out against the disposal of a wife, Jesus is claiming the place that a woman holds in a family. Jesus is claiming the place where a woman holds in God's heart as someone who matters. And by talking about children as the ones who will enter into the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying here that there is nothing, nothing disposable about any person, man, woman, or child. Not then and not now. When we open the door, we see that we can let a little light in and amazing things can happen. We see that there is no boogeyman lurking under the bed, but we do know that sin and evil do exist. It is in these mass shootings that once again murder God's children and break our hearts. Can we pause for a moment and imagine what it would have been like to receive that news about your child, about your parent, about your husband or your wife 
or your brother or sister? There is evil and sin in the killing of innocent people, victims, and it is in our treatment or our lack of treatment in our response to the mentally ill. Can we let some light in and see that that monster is really just a chair? That murderer is a mentally ill human being. There are people in this world, children of God, like you and like me, who feel disposed of, who feel like they don't matter. Maybe in our world that cherishes perfection in mind and body and spirit, maybe it's true. Maybe they don't matter. Can we look to see the disposed and displaced among us? In the old and in the infirm, in the sick, the lonely, and the broken. And can we look, go beyond seeing them, and reach out with God's arms of compassion? That alligator in the light is really just a dirty pair of pants. Can we stand up to the evil in sin that surrounds us and expose it to the light of day? What is a mentally ill man doing with 13 guns? Is the letting in the light just too hard? Why are we afraid like children frozen in their fear of the dark? We must rethink how we treat our mentally ill, and we must use common sense when it comes to issues surrounding ownership of guns. Christ is calling us. Christ is calling us now to respond against the exploitation and disposal of his people. And that is what is happening to each of these incidents, to each one of these people, to the mothers and the fathers, to the wives and the husbands, the sons and the daughters, brothers and sisters and friends, whose lives are ripped apart by gun violence. This is not politics. This is a social justice issue. Like the women and children that Jesus defends, the, these are people whose lives should matter more. Can we love each other the way that God loves us? Can we see each other as God sees us with God eyes, as precious people with valuable lives? Can we see each other as people who matter? Can we finally love each other enough to do something? Amen.